So it is, it is so great to have you here. Could you join me in just welcoming <laughs> Titus Baraka? Titus, we have been so looking forward to this. Um, and thank you so much for being with the kids this last Wednesday night. I mean, I've just continued to hear so many, so many positive things about how much the kids loved being with you. Thank you for having me too. So um, before, before we jump into, we're gonna have a conversation together here. Um, I'm gonna make sure you all can see over there. Can you see? You're good? Okay. Um, before we jump into our conversation together this morning, uh, today we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of being in this building here. And it was October 6, 2013, that we had our first worship service in this facility. And uh, we're just celebrating and giving God thanks for his faithfulness and that whole process of helping us discern where to build and the way in which this all came together. So many people who gave sacrificially uh, in order for this building to happen. In fact, I got a text this morning from Scott Heemstra, who just said, hey, he said, tell everybody hi, and we're just celebrating with you all this morning. And Scott was one of those people who played a vital role, uh, putting lots of hours into helping us discern what to do. Um, so as way of celebration, we have cake this morning that we're going to be serving from 10 to 11 o'clock. So after the service, it's not just any cake, it's Costco cake. So if you haven't had Costco cake, you got to check out some of this cake. Um, so that's what, that's what the balloons are for out there. Again, we hope that you'll check out the, the mission table with a number of opportunities, especially for Christmas gifts for our, for our kids that are in Haiti. Speaking of the building... So Andy Keller came across this video this week, Titus, before this building was built, with a little bit of prophecy from you. I wonder if we could play that. I was closing my eyes and I, I saw like two big hall, big buildings. One was a building for cows and the other was building a store for corn. And the, the doors flung open and a crowd of people came out and they all ran into the building, or the church building. And there are people coming out of the sanctuary with the, with the cups of, with the cups of uh, coffee. And, and they were coming to meet them and they were ministering to them they were around there when they were having coffee. And they were ministering to them and they were, they were just coming, yearning, like very desperately in need of help. And then the congregation just came in, and that area was a place where they were ministering to their needs, praying for them and sharing to them. And when they finished praying, then the whole thing just went. And they were saying, what? So I just prayed and just mentioned it to God. So I thought it's good for me to mention to you, mm -hmm. to know that uh, I'm seeing great mm. opening for ministry in, in, in that place. Mm. I know in Uganda we don't have a place where people take coffee, but today God has really revealed to me that it's a place more than for coffee, for taking coffee, but it's a place for ministering to each other, where the congregation can show their gifts and express ministry to each other, service to each other, and to talk to each other and pray for one another as they take coffee. So, I really thank God for that uh, wow. revelation. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that? Yeah, I think I didn't know that they were recording me. <laughs> <laughs> I got trapped. <laughs> Your hair was a little bit darker. Yeah, then, I, I noticed. Was, I was still young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, but what, a, what a cool thing. We, it was so fun to come across that. And, you know, true, really I mean, amazing. that was... Amazing. God has used this facility and, and coffee mm. as a way of really, really ministering to each other. So, yeah. Yeah. Titus, um, again, it's such a gift to have you here. Uh, Thank we, you. We have been in a ministry partnership with you for over a decade now, connected with Words of Hope and some other things, then a number of other ministries in Uganda. But I'm, I'm wondering if you would just be willing to share with us, what do you see God doing right now in Uganda? Uh, where, where do you see God at work um, do you have a story or a couple stories that you can share about what you see God doing? Well, well, thank you. Greetings to all of you. And I want to really, first of all, begin by saying I thank God for our partnership, especially in ministry and especially praying for one another. 
In 2003, 2002, when I completed my studies in Western Seminary, I didn't know how my ministry was going to be, but when I went back, I had a vision to go back to Uganda to begin mentoring young people, especially for missions, because I am passionate for mission. I was brought up by Campus Crusade and taught about how to reach out to others, and it became kind of part of me that I love uh, mentoring other people into that. So when I went back, I started a center called Bethesda, and that's where I wanted people to come to experience healing and to go out to testify. But I didn't know how I was going to do it. Then came a team from Trinity. John first came and he saw I had a small container and I put there Bethesda. And he got excited. He said, oh, we have Bethesda in, in Orange City. So. I didn't know what it would mean, and then I told him my vision, and then he came here, he took some people from this congregation to train counselors, and they came in 2008, and that's when our ministry of Bethesda started blooming, and I want to thank God that he has blessed us through this ministry. Now we have a big group of young people, we mentor over 200 young people, mm. who are mentored specifically to grow in the Lord and to be able to reach out to fellow young people. We also have a, a gathering which is known as Know Your Freedom in Christ. It's not a church. We decided to make that center a place where people come to gather and we share the gospel from the biblical point of view and teach them about what the Bible tells us, us about being a Christian. And now the gathering of Know Your Freedom in Christ has brought many people. We have over 400 people gather every month, once a month, and it is a Know Your Freedom. And we have people from all denominations. It is not Anglican. It's, we have Muslims sometimes come over there. And we have found that many people get reached through this ministry. Every Thursday, we have many who come for counseling. And sometimes in America here, you don't have exorcism. But if you want to see some, come to Uganda. Yeah. Um, many people come with a lot of evil spirits because they have been involved in witchcraft and in occultism. So we come and we pray for them. And they, they go back when they are helped by the grace of God. And that's what the Lord is doing. And then we have the school. Right, yeah. Uh, we have the school which... I started from my home area because I grew up from a very poor village where education was not considered as anything. And God helped me and educated me and I was able to, to know what it means to benefit from being educated. So I have a passion for my people from my village. So my dad provided some land and I started a secondary school. And I also didn't know how this secondary school would really be able to impact the people of the community. And so we started, we struggled a little bit, and then afterwards, uh, Trinity came in. And we went there like we were going to do mission, but eventually, um, Todd, uh, don't ask me the other name because it's very complicated to grow something. Uh, Todd came in and they came up with the vision of saying, why don't we come in and partner to help support students from here? Right now, the school is now thriving. Many young people have been impacted, and especially the kind of way we do the Christian vacation and the activities that we try to instill in them, the Christian character in them through their academic, it has impacted many people. Now the school is growing, maybe I'll tell you this later, the school, many people want to bring their students, not because of academics only, but because of what the school changes the lives of the, the students there. Uh. That's so great to hear, Titus. So there's the Bethesda Christian um, Counseling Center. Um, there's the Freedom in Christ uh, gatherings. I mean, I've, I've got to see all of this stuff. Um, and then the Christian school. And, and Trinity, I, I think that many of you know this, but I just want to make sure for those of you who don't, that Trinity has been a vital 
maybe even like one of the vital partners in, in these ministries. Um, how many of you have, have gone to Uganda? I know we've sent groups. Raise, raise your hand. Browers, you guys just went like last summer, right? Yeah. Um, others, raise your hand if you've, if you've been to Uganda. Uh, we're looking at the potential of an upcoming trip, uh, maybe as soon as next summer, and would really uh, love to invite you to be a part of that. Um, there's something about going and seeing what God is doing in, in all of these ministries and, and, and others as well. So Titus, we're, today, I'm in, a, in a bit, I'm going to be preaching the last sermon in our series. We've been doing a series on our core values as a church. And our last core value that we're going to talk about today is missional engagement. And you've already said, I mean, just in terms of mission, just the, the, the importance of mission in, on your own heart, I think about the importance of mission for this congregation. One, one of the things that I want to talk about in a bit, and I'm kind of looking to you now to help me preach my sermon, <laughs> um, is I think sometimes we think about mission only as places that are far away, where we send others and, and support them in the work that they're doing there, and that is really important, and, and that's vital. But we want to think about mission as not just being kind of going somewhere else, but when we talk about missional, living a missional life, it's about seeing our everyday lives as an opportunity to be on mission with God right where we are. And honestly, I think you are one of the people for me, I mean, spending time with you a few summers ago and watching you, you, you model for me what it means to live all of life on mission. Like you're just not, you're not just doing mission kind of, you know, every once in a while, or it's kind of this activity that counts as mission, but, but you just, you're just somebody who you just live every day with your eyes open to how God is working and, and inviting you to be a part of it. What, what helps you to really kind of think about your life as about being on mission with, with God? What, what helps you think about mission as a way of life and not just maybe some activities that we do every once in a while? Um, thank you. That's a, a little bit a hard question, but um, looking at my life, growing up from a Christian family, and uh, I grew up knowing going to church, and uh, it was easier for me to play church. I don't know whether that means that is my Uganda English. Playing church, sometimes you get used to church, you go to church and you do everything. It's like doing some gymnastics, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, the Lord be with you. And, and you also throw him back that and also with you. And you find people don't show any change in their lives. And therefore in my, as a pastor, I developed a, a kind of passion to start saying, how can we impact the lives of the people, especially to, got, to get to know what it means. And I realized that it's not about preaching but it's about discipleship. Okay. And so of recent now, we have a great emphasis on discipling people. Sometimes we go firefighting, we say, yo, the world is going this, now people are doing these kind of things, and we begin arguing about some theological issues. But I do think that the most important thing is if people are discipled well, mm. then they know Jesus Christ well. You don't have to argue about these other things that are either unchristian or Christian because they will have known Jesus Christ. And therefore, in Bethesda and in Know Your Freedom in Christ, we have these four approaches in our doing discipleship. One is we purpose to be intentional in our discipleship, not just doing a series of discipleship, but we are intentional. Secondly, we want to be relational in such a way that we bring up topics of discipleship of spiritual growth and we relate with each other discussing not just one person monologuing or talking but we discuss that to see how can we impact one another through relational kind of discussion and then three transformational that we aim at people's lives to be transformed yes. to be more like Jesus Christ and when they become more like Jesus Christ, then the world will see who they are and then they will admire that. And that takes us to the fourth one, which is missional. Huh. That means when Christ transforms you, yeah. then you become missional. You like to go out yeah. to bring others to Christ. 
And therefore, we do that through teaching people, through experiencing life together, through accountability. We, do, we become accountable to each other to make sure we help one another to grow in the faith. And then for the leaders to mentor, to model, and to multiply mm. the disciples. Thank I you. love that. So intentionality, mm -hmm. relationships, mm -hmm. discipleship mm -hmm. that leads to missional, a missional life. Exactly. Yeah, that is so good. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just, I'm curious, is there anything else that you feel like the Lord has put on your heart to speak to us? Um, first of all, we want to thank God for our partnership together. Thank you for praying for us. Um, right now, I would appreciate praying for me especially. I am beginning to slow down. I'm beginning to slow down. I've been running up and down in my young age and doing many things. I had so many uh, things in my way, but I want to slow down. So my purpose now, I have three targets in my life. One, I want to aim at revitalizing my relationship with the Lord as a person and also revitalizing my vision for ministry that I become Christ-centered. Second point is I am in the process of um, succession plan, mentoring some people to take yeah. up leadership okay. of Bethesda, Words of Hope, and also in Hope Christian High School. And so I am trying to mentor some young people who will be able to take over or to see them take up the leadership so that I can step back so that I see the continuity of this ministry. And number three, I want to finish well. Yes. The life expectancy in Africa, if I have lived, I'm now 62, I do consider myself living in bonus. God has given me bonus years, but I don't know how long I will live. But I want to see that the future has some people who will take over. Right now, I am in the process of translating the Bible into my tribe because I realized recently we don't have a Bible in the Kuku language. Kuku is the, the language that we are using, but you, we are reading a Bari Bible, which is not ours. So I want to see to it that the few days God has given me ahead, I want to translate the Bible into my language. And if I leave this world, I want to leave the Bible for my people. Mm. And that is the prayer that you pray for yeah. me. Can we, can we pray for you now? Sure. I want, I, can I have you come down here? Derek, can I, would you be willing to, and I'm gonna invite others who maybe have a connection with Titus um, or anybody, anybody else, any, any other elders or deacons who wanna come and let's, let's put you kind of here in the center and we're gonna surround you and we're gonna put, put hands on you Joel, come on up. Anybody else want to join us? Come on, Joan. Megan. Hi, Megan. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to encourage like we do in Uganda. Because even if you don't have any connection with us in Uganda, you've never come there. But you have been probably part of us as we are one body. Maybe you can do it by stretching your hand and pray, not only for me, but for Uganda. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Let's stretch out our hands and pray. You just want me to pray? Yeah. All right. Father God, we come to you today and we rejoice in your goodness and your grace. Lord, we see your faithfulness in our lives and we see your faithfulness in the life of Titus and his family and his. Uh, friends and relatives and partners in, in ministry, Lord. God, we, uh, we commit them to you. We commit to you our friends, and we commit to you the people that are in, in Uganda that are involved in the ministry that Titus is involved with. Thank you for our relationship with them. Lord, we lift Titus up to you. We thank you for his desire for succession, his desire to end well, his desire to live into the ministries and to see what you are doing and what he needs to be a part of. Lord, thank you for our privilege of being a part of Titus's life and for the blessing he's been to us, for his vision that he received for this church, this building, and our congregation. And Lord, for this relationship, we give you glory and honor and praise. We thank you that you are larger and bigger than this community and that you bring other parts of the world together and that together we serve you and see your faithfulness and your goodness. 
We give you all glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, Titus will be sticking around for the morning. I would encourage you afterwards to, uh, if you want to come up and, and interact with him, encourage him. Um, yeah, we'd love to have you just interact with him this morning. And don't forget about uh, our lunch that will take place later today. Friends, let's continue to worship God together. Would you stand with us? How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy Step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ.
be seated. Within each of us, there is a genetic blueprint that shapes the development and functioning of every cell in our body. And like our DNA, our core values create a foundational identity that we bring with us into each new season of life. As a church, our core values are our deepest convictions of who God has called us to be. The things that even as the world around us changes, they will continue to define who we are and how we do ministry together. You are the, the risen one. You are the one who is on the move in the world, not just here, but in every place. And we think of our brothers and sisters in Uganda today. Lord, and so many of our other mission partnerships, as we've already mentioned and prayed for, we think about uh, the Middle East and the turmoil there. And we think especially of the Christians in Palestine. Father, encourage them, strengthen them today. And Lord, as we, as we continue the sermon that's already been going, um, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would, would keep speaking to us, that we might hear you, that we might receive your spirit, that we might be impassioned and empowered to be a part of your work in the world. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. So, I want to I want to just kind of finish the sermon in a little bit of the time that we have together. I invited Titus to preach, and he felt like maybe having me do this last one in our core value series. But I just appreciate, brother, what you said. I, I want to say at this point for my sermon, everything Titus said, I I just I agree what he said. Um, I especially love the connection that you make between discipleship and mission, because that's we're, we're having the same conversations. That this is. This is about discipleship, and to be transformed into the image of Jesus will lead us into a missional life. So our core values, this is the last, the last Sunday as we look at these. Of course, we'll continue to engage them and live them out all the time. But here they are, just to remind you of our six core values here at Trinity. This, this is really the DNA that's at the heart of who we are and how we do ministry together, centered in the gospel. Biblical and vibrant worship, radical hospitality, growing in community, openness to change, and then lastly, but certainly not least, missional engagement. I want to offer just a few more reflections on what it means for us to be a missionally engaged people together. And before I do that, though, we're going to hear some scripture. And Kristen, would you come forward and would you share with us from the Gospel of John, chapter 20? And this is part of John's version of the, the Easter story. And the words are going to be on the screen, so we're going to do verses 19 down through 23. Coming into this passage, I want you to think about the most intense time you've ever lived through. Take those feelings, those emotions, the, the fact that you're trying to, to barely keep up with what's happening. Uh, I will, to, for time's sake, I won't go through everything leading up to what we're reading today. But Christ has been crucified. Mary Magdalene saw the stone rolled away. She went back and told the disciples. They ran to Peter and the other disciple, John, ran to the tomb. They saw that it was empty, returned home. Mary Magdalene remains there crying, weeping. It wasn't until she hears her name. She hears her name and she turns and sees her teacher, her master, and recognizes that it's Jesus, that Jesus was right there, who she mistook as the gardener, that it was Jesus. Jesus tells her, go and tell the rest of the disciples, tell the brothers that I am ascending to my Father. So that is where we come when we read what we're about to read here. Take those emotions, those feelings you've had from your intense times in your life into what we read. When it was evening on that day, 
the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kristen. You can just set that right there. And thank you for that context. That was perfect. So the disciples are hiding behind locked doors, afraid for their life. As Kristen set up some of that context for you, this is what John's gospel tells us the disciples are doing on that night of the very first Easter. They're not dancing in the streets. They're not singing worship songs. They're not scurrying through the alleys of Jerusalem, knocking on doors, whispering, Christ is risen. No, they're hiding away, afraid for their lives. The risen Jesus then appears to them, comes to them, stands in their midst in his resurrected body, and he speaks these words to them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Such important words. He speaks them twice after uh, he shows, he, he'll do it again after he shows them his hands and his side. And it, it's, it's this peace that Jesus had promised his disciples when they sat together for the Last Supper, the Passover meal, back in John 14, verse 27. He had said to them, I'm going to be going away, but my peace I will leave you. My peace I will give to you. And now it's in this moment on the evening of this first Easter that Jesus gives them what he promised. He speaks his peace upon them. He breathes his peace into them. And it makes all the difference. Now, the word peace, the Greek word is derived from the Hebrew word shalom. And so many of you have heard of, of, of that word. You're familiar with it. But it's important to point out that this peace that Jesus speaks upon them and breathes into them is so much more than, than the English word we tend to think of when we think of peace, which I, I think most often has to do with the absence of conflict or maybe we think of the feeling of calm or tranquility. But this, this Hebrew word, shalom, is so much more nuanced and so much more expansive. And it really carries with it this idea of a, a state of well-being, of wholeness, of harmony that infuses all of relationships. Uh, another way to think about it, it's, it's universal flourishing in which things are the way that God designed them to be. It goes back to the beginning John's gospel, more than any of the other gospels, all of them are doing this, but, but this, is, this is pointing us back. John is pointing us back to the creation story, and the Easter story is a story of new creation, of God who created this world with his word and his breath, ruach, brought all things into being, God who breathed into Adam and Eve and formed human beings, from the, the, the clay of the ground, uh, God who, who, who set them in the garden and put them in right relationship with himself and with each other and with all of creation, this is the picture of shalom. But if you know the story, you know that, that sin entered that picture through the serpent's coaxing and there was rebellion and Adam and Eve were not content to be in the image of God, wanted to be gods themselves, and they rebelled against God, and shalom was broken, and, and the rest of the story, really the story of the Bible from there on out, is the missional heart of God on the move in the world to set things right and to restore this shalom. And all of this comes to a climax, to a culmination in Jesus. Jesus is the shalom of God in the flesh. Jesus is the one who comes to set things right, 
Paul puts it this way in Colossians. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, this is Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, and then pay attention to this line right here, making peace, making shalom, setting everything right that's gone wrong through the blood of the cross. In his death and resurrection, Jesus brings God's shalom. Jesus brings healing and forgiveness. Jesus comes to the disciples, and he breathes these words of peace, and, and, and there's this sense here of him restoring them. But here's the part that I really want to emphasize just in the few minutes that we have left this morning. Not only does Jesus bring this peace for them, but with the, the breathing of the Holy Spirit into their lives, they are also given a commission. They are given a call. They are given an assignment. And, and some of the most important words in, in this exchange, what Jesus says to them is this. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And those are the words that I want to just let kind of be in the space this morning. As the Father has sent me, 40 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus references how the Father has sent him to do the will of the Father. This is the first time now at the end of the story, in its climax, where Jesus now turns to his disciples. He turns to you and me and says, as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. The Latin word for mission, missio, means sent, sending. To be a missional people carries with it this idea, friends, that, that we do not exist for ourselves as a church. And you've heard me say this over the years. I'm going to say it again. Trinity, we do not exist for ourselves, but we exist to participate in the mission of God in and for the world. Without mission, there is no church. Amen? This is why we exist. It's, it's one of my favorite things about this church is that mission is on the heart of who this church is. Not just in terms of supporting mission partners. And again, we want to do that. We, we care about this. And, and by the way, could you put up that slide for me, Kelsey? Um, we want to encourage you to check out the mission table today. It's the one with like the mission opportunities. There's a number of ways that we want to partner with God in mission that's happening in other places. So I'd encourage you to check that out and pick up a, 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 um, a bookmark today, and you can see all of our mission partners and pray for them. But here's the other piece to that. To be missional is to partner with God's work in other places, supporting and partnering with and learning from people like Titus. But as Titus and I talked about, here's the other aspect of what it means to be sent. It's not just that we're sending others to go somewhere else and to do work in a far-off place. To be missional, to embrace our sentness, is to recognize that God is calling us and has sent us, you personally and us together, to be on mission with God right here. I want you to think about your everyday life, your ordinary everyday life, your relationships, in your families, in your neighborhoods, at work, in school, in our community. Think about your everyday life as the primary arena in which God is moving and inviting you to be a part of what he's doing. In this way, every single one of us is called to be a missionary. It's going to look different for each of us, but we have all been called to be a part a bearing witness to this shalom. God gives us the Spirit in order to work this shalom, not just in our lives, but through our lives into the life of others. To not just believe the gospel, but to become a people who are the gospel, who are becoming the gospel, who see mission not just as some of the activities we do now and then, but to see mission as a way of life together. Do you hear the Father calling you today? Saying, as I've sent my son, now I'm sending you. Let me close just with the story here. 
And I was thinking about this this week with our partnership in Uganda, Titus, but I was thinking about this also with just some of the events that have happened in the Middle East. And this has been especially heavy on my heart because Tammy and I um, have some close relationships with Christian Palestinians in the West Bank. And in our previous church, we would go and we would put on an art and sports camp. Titus, that's where we got the idea to do this with Uganda. And we got to do that again, by the way. Um, but in art and sports camp, we would do this at, at, um, at Shepherd's Field High School. It's a Christian high school in the West Bank. Shepherd's Field, because they believe that that's where the shepherds came and announced to the, or, or the angels came to announce to the shepherds the birth of the Messiah. I think about these Palestinian Christians who often feel forgotten and in the midst of just the heartache right now, and it's a complicated issue, but I think regardless of where we're at and how we feel about the politics of it all, I think we can all agree that it's, it's painful to just see violence continuing to escalate and so many people, especially civilians on both sides who are being lost. I think uh, 200,000 now Palestinians who are being displaced but I think especially of my Christian friends because they said, Brian, when you go back to the United States, remind people that we're here. A lot of people don't think about the Christian church's presence in a place like the West Bank in particular. So I want you to come with me to Shepherd's High School. It's a cool evening in July. And we just finished a five-day uh, five-day camp. It was an arts and sports camp. There were 60 students that showed up for this. And we had so much fun learning the Bible together and making art and, and learning um, different sports skill sets. And on the evening of that last day, a handful of these students decide that they want to take us and give us a tour around their town, Beit Sahur. It's nestled right up to Bethlehem. They are so proud of their town. They love their town. A separation wall with Israeli soldiers gripping rifles holds them captive. And as we walk up and down the sidewalks, Israeli jets thunder above us across the sky. It's unnerving to, to we Americans, but for them, it, they don't flinch because this is their reality. This is just the tension they live with every day. They take us up and down the streets, up and down some hills, pointing things out, and we end the tour that night by going to their church. They love their church. We walk into the sanctuary, we walk up to the communion table, and on the wall, there are words in Arabic that are written. One of the members of our group asks the students, what, what, what do those words mean? And then a, a young lady, her name is Reme. That's not a picture of her, but, but that girl looks similar to Reme says to us, she says, well, here's what it means. Here's, here's how it translates. In English, it means, you belong to Jesus, and now I am sending you out like Jesus into the world. And then she does the most beautiful, spirit-filled thing in that moment. Reme looks at each of us, like looks us in the eyes, and she goes down the line, and she says, Cole, you belong to Jesus. Kent, you belong to Jesus. Diane, you are Jesus. Then she shifts. You are Jesus. You are Jesus. You are Jesus. She speaks the word so personally and so powerfully to each of us. She says it so matter-of-factly, like she is the preacher and we are her congregation. And we are. And here we thought as Americans that God was sending us there to be a part of his mission and he was in some sense, but in that moment, I realized that we are the ones who are receiving mission from Reme. And that it's from there, the Holy Spirit was sending us back to our place to be on mission with God here too. Friends, mission is always a two-way street, right, Titus? I, I think, honestly, I think we get more from you than we probably give to you, but it's always a two-way street. We're always in it together. It's amazing to me how more often than not in my life, I have realized more deeply who I am as a disciple and what it means to be called and sent 
from the people to whom I thought I was being sent to. And maybe you've experienced that too. But friends, I want to remind us today, as we come to the conclusion of this series and think about who we are and why we exist as a church, I want to remind you today, I want to let Ramey's words remind you If she was here, up here, I think she would probably look at each of you in the eyes. And she would probably go around the sanctuary pointing to each of you, and she would say, you belong to Jesus. And now the Father is sending you. And you are Jesus. And you are Jesus. And you are Jesus. And you are Jesus. Jesus. Carter, you are Jesus. We are Christ together. His presence in this world that is broken, but it's a world that God so loves and God intends to redeem. We're in this together. Amen? Lord, thank you that you are a God who does not leave the world in its darkness or brokenness. Thank you that you are a God who is always on the move, that mission begins with you, that mission is part of your very character and nature. And that we are not the church unless we are joining you in your mission. So may we hear that call afresh today, individually and together. Father, send us. Send us from this place to be the presence of Jesus in a world that is uh, lost and broken and yet so loved by you. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Hey, can we stand?